the future of sustainability with Hervé Dutte. All this and more on today's episode of The Wave Strength. Welcome to The Wave Strength, innovative pension solutions for a secure retirement. Presented by Pacific Life. All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the Wave Strength Podcast. Uh, my name is Jim Breen. I'll be your host today. We have a very special guest with us today, uh, a gentleman by the name of Hervé Dutte. Uh, and Hervé Dutte is the Chief Sustainability Officer with BNP Americas. And Hervé, I want to thank you so much for, for joining us on, on today's podcast. Thank you, Jim. And um, it's my pleasure to discuss uh, today with you. Yeah, it's a, it's a real important topic, obviously, Hervé, and you have uh, quite a bit of experience. So we, we were connected um, uh, a short time ago together and uh, just listening to you and the few times that we've, we've had the opportunity to, to discuss and just reading about your background, you obviously have a significant amount of experience uh, in, in this field. But before we get to that, um, let's, let's just talk a little bit about, um, you know, a little bit of a b background here. Um, so maybe you, w with our listeners, you can, you can share a little bit about, about of your background, Hervé. Sure. Um, so as you can e hear, um, I grew up uh, in France, um, had uh, the pleasure to study in great universities in the UK and the US afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, I've spent my entire career at uh, BNP Paribas. Um, and mm -hmm. this current role is actually the third chapter in my career. Um, before that, um, I spent a, a large chunk of my uh, professional life in uh, capital market activities, uh, more specifically in the derivative space, uh, trading and managing activities spanning across commodities, currencies, fixed income and electronic markets. And about seven years ago, um, I created the first position of Chief Sustainability Officer at BNP Paribas, and for which I cover the Americas region. Um, in this role, I, I lead the bank's uh, regional strategy for sustainable finance, corporate social responsibility, and what we call company engagement, which is the positioning of BNP Paribas in society. Uh, as a large okay. and uh, universal bank with more than 200,000 employees, just to give a, a sense of its size in probably around 70 countries, um, we realized uh, in, in, in a renewed fashion uh, a few years ago the, the responsibility that we have in society, given our size um, and given the influence that we have in some specific sectors uh, that we do finance. Mm -hmm. So we don't mean to have an opinion on everything, but we believe that when you finance, you know, a large, uh, large segments of uh, in the industry that we, we bear responsibility to to influence um, the course of, of uh, the developments that we finance uh, for, the, for, for the best of society. Uh, that, that's wonderful to hear. And I mean, some time ago, so, the, you know, you were really on the forefront of the sustainability movement, it sounds like. Yes. And I think um, what, uh, what was uh, critical was that back seven years ago, uh, a number of us who were, who were in the, um, in, in the front lines, I would say, in, in the client, mm -hmm. in the front in, lines, yeah. in, in the client facing positions, um, we um, really had, had, uh, had at our heart uh, to ask ourselves, how could we, with the very uh, core of our work, uh, influence society? And when you work in a CIB division, a corporate investment, investment banking division of a bank, quite frankly, what we do is fairly esoteric. Uh, we do uh, revolving mm -hmm. credit facilities, uh, quantum options, um, equity linked bonds, and many other things, and go and try to figure out how you can influence the world with that. But this being said, mm -hmm. that did force us to be extremely rigorous and find ways to have an influence um, away from the easy way to to get out with the with a challenge, which are typically um, uh, sponsorships or uh, volunteering, which are all good, but it's only a use of uh, our surplus. Uh, what really matters is how we use what makes our day to day the core of our business uh, to 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 have a, a material and positive impact on society. 
Well, that, that's interesting to hear you say that and, you know, working to make sure that it has a positive impact. So let's talk about that because, you know, you, you discuss the fact that seven years ago or seven years plus, it sounds like, you know, you really were on the front lines. Uh, and now here we are, uh, middle of 2021. Um, hopefully seeing, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the end of, of the pandemic in sight. We see a lot of companies really focusing on the fact that, you know, maybe this isn't just a fad, right? That this really is maybe something that they need to really focus their sights on. Maybe, maybe you could discuss a little bit about that. That's right. Um, I, I, and we clearly are at an inflection point. But first, we should go back on the, on, on the last seven years. Uh, to understand mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what, what what were the forces at, at play, and the the question yeah. we should ask ourselves is why today, why is everyone today talking about sustainability? When you think about it, uh, SRI, socially responsible investing, has been around for probably fifty years um, at least. Uh, it's okay. a movement that really emerged in the 70s and grew in the 80s when some uh, investing investors dec decided to enter into some exclusionary practices. It was at the time of apartheid in uh, South Africa. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, the SRA movement, the the UN with the Millennium Development Goals in 2000 um, and so on, remain niche. So what has changed over the last seven years that everyone now talks about it? And I think what's one, I think there are two, two, two forces. One is money. Uh, I think the big mm -hmm. difference is that we have managed finally to create a virtual circle where sustainability can be directly linked with uh, money creation. Uh, and I think okay. it has been the change of focus from investing to financing. I mentioned earlier that um, some of us um, launched this initiative uh, from the front lines within the CIB division. And within the CIB division, all what we do, it's financing or manage managing risk of our clients. Unlike the asset management side of, of the firm, which is more about creating portfolios, you know, selecting securities, um, and creating uh, invest, in investment funds. When you're looking at the financing side, you're looking one at one client at a time. In fact, you're looking at one transaction at a time. And the question we ask mm -hmm. ourselves is how can we create uh, additional benefits to borrowers of money when we are financing either sustainable projects or when we are financing companies that are recognized for being sustainability leaders. And with that, mm -hmm. we've created an ecosystem where everyone can find an interest. Um, investors um, or investment managers certainly can cater the needs of retail investors that are demanding to have impact through their investments. Uh, we banks, uh, you know, can earn uh, underwriting business when we focus on uh, green bonds, social bonds, and many other things. Borrowers of money can find new outlets, uh, new pockets of money when they are trying to finance uh, sustainable or sustainability-related uh, initiatives. Uh, rating agencies can integrate ESG within uh, uh, credit analysis and so on and so forth. So this has really been the movement that has brought that has brought to the fore um, the uh, sustainability. Now, last year was really a, a turning point uh, uh, because mm -hmm. while the last seven years we really focused on the opportunity side uh, of sustainability, showing uh, you know how you could optimize funding by linking that funding with sustainability related initiatives of course this was only mm -hmm. available to the best in class uh, but what last year has brought to the fore is that uh, there is another side of esg which is risk uh, and risk does mm -hmm. apply to everyone and in fact that there is a clock ticking uh, we know that by 2050 we need to be at what we call net zero uh, in terms of carbon emission and so this is really creating a big acceleration. And actually the pandemic uh, which uh, crisis, which was probably the first sustainability crisis of the 21st century, I think brought, uh, accelerated the realization that we had uh, such a uh, limited amount of time to, 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 to make the turn.
And I would say, you know, every crisis brings brings with it the need for a big step forward, and especially towards new transparency. Um, if you think about it, the 1929 stock market crisis brought the need for transparency on profits, and that led to the mm -hmm. creation of the SEC and the accounting principles. The 2008 subprime crisis brought the need on transparency of bank on banks' leverage, and with it came uh, a lot of regulations, like uh, by the name of Dodd Frank, Volcker, and many many others. I, I would claim that last year's crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, brought the need for transparency on environmental and social impact. And we ha there is one thing that we didn't have uh, in that way at least 15 years ago, and it's data. So data is the enabling technology to get better disclosure uh, and, with, uh, and, and, and as we know, what you can measure, you can manage. So the two forces, basically, uh, just to summarize, of the last seven years have been money, uh, cre cre moving to an ecosystem where sustainability can be sustainably economical, and data, because with data, uh, we can make progress. Excellent. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is, this is very, very, very... Uh, poignant and just especially with everything that has happened in these last 15 months. Um, and so then looking then to the future, right? How will this then, in your opinion, reshape the landscape sure. of, uh, of our future? So now we're, um, you know, this, the last seven years, we set the stage. Now we are in the big mm -hmm. acceleration. Mm -hmm. Um, and and this will this will be the topic of the next ten years. Um, it's the time we can accelerate and and, and quite frankly we either make it or or, or fail. Um, and there are two strong forces behind this acceleration. As I told you the story, the last seven years were primarily led by the private sector, primarily by the financial sector, uh, giving incentives to the corporate sector to make commitments. Uh, now we're uh, moving to, to the next level. And the two forces at play, uh, the first one is the public sector. Um, for the okay. first time, the public sector, in a while, the public sector is coming back to the front scene. And especially with the, large, uh, with the last large piece of the puzzle uh, re-entering uh, the conversation, which was the US. Um, and so now we have, you know, from China to uh, Americas with uh, Europe in, in the middle, we have a, 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 a very aligned world um, that is set on uh, setting regulations uh, and setting targets uh, and, 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 and moving towards. So I think this is a, a huge force. Um, that will uh, bring to scale what the private sector has uh, uh, done over the last seven years. The second um, is <clears throat> uh, the powerful coalitions that are finally, finally um, crystallizing across the financial sectors, sector. Um, long story short, today you have something called GFANS, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, uh, that is led by Mark Carney, uh, and that... Mm -hmm. Uh, is an umbrella uh, for over 160 financial institutions uh, representing more than $70 trillion that have committed to align their lending and or investing portfolios to net zero. So in fact, under the GFANS, you have the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, the Net Zero Asset Manager Alliance, the Net Zero Banking Alliance, and soon the Net Zero insurers alliance. So, so the four main segments of the uh, financial in industry, aside from the official sector. Um, and, and, you know, when a large corporation like Walmart or FedEx, just to name a few, make a, a net zero commitment, it's fantastic. These are huge corporations mm -hmm. and certainly it's very important. But when you think of large financial institutions, which I will not name, you know, but have Trillion, trillions of dollars of investment portfolios, then you have a, a huge leverage. So I think this is a force, you know, when large banks, large um, asset managers, large, large insurance uh, are making a collective commitment to net zero, this will both increase the magnitude, but also 
the the speed of transition of me megatrends and with it it will foster both new risk because you know the the sectors that have to transition well uh, believe me uh, two or three years from now the pressure will be uh, far m greater than what we can imagine today mm -hmm. but it will also uh, mm -hmm. uh, present a lot of opportunities so i'm convinced that there is extraordinary economic benefit that awaits us from this transition that's part of the story mm -hmm. of why banks and asset managers are now beginning to move forcefully uh, and as a whole and it's probably the biggest opportunity for job creation since um, the industrial revolution Interesting. It, it, gr great insight. And yes, these next several years will really begin to see, uh, um, you know, if, if we can fast forward, you know, I'm sure looking back, we would we would really begin to see, as you say, this is a pivotal moment right now um, for for uh, the sustainability arena. And, you know, in, in, in talking about that, then, you know, what platforms or what products, innovative products, innovative opportunities are available? Um, and maybe you can shed some light on that, Hervé. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, uh, I was saying sustainable finance um, will substitute traditional finance by 2025. And mm -hmm. I'm revising this tune a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay. In fact, ESG is becoming integrated into all financial products and financing, I think, over the coming years. So in, 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 for, for, if you rephrase it that, that way, I was right. Um, but I think, in fact, you know, as, and as we witness this acceleration towards net zero, in fact, traditional finance, whether it's M&A, spin-offs, uh, or, or just traditional financing, will be the, the, the toolkit to finance this transition and what will be great is that the purpose of those financing will be to uh, gradually reorient uh, businesses towards where they need to be. Um, mm -hmm. Specifically called sustainable finance products will continue to grow, of course. Um, and But will serve for more, I think, dedicated pur purposes. Um, so first of all, what, what, are the, what, what is the point of sustainable finance products? And I would say it's really to optimize funding when you are financing either sustainable projects or really sustainable corporations. And the benefits that borrowers find when they use those products can be a better funding cost than by using traditional finance. It can be investor diversification because when you issue, issue a green bond or a social bond, you, you uncover uh, pockets of money that uh, regular uh, financings couldn't reach, like sustainable funds, for example. Um, those products are also the opportunity to communicate of a core business strategy that is anchored around sustainability to the financial community. Uh, it can build uh, internal engagement and staff retention. It can be good PR and so on and so forth. So first of all, that's, that's the purpose of those uh, sustainable finance products. Now, Broadly speaking, you have, we've seen two generations of products. So the first discovery of sustainable finance about seven years ago was uh, that by labeling the use of proceeds, you could uncover sources of capital that uh, we didn't uh, suspect. So um, that was the creation of labeled products like green bonds, social bonds, gender bonds, uh, SDG bonds, blue bonds, uh, COVID-19 response bond, pandemics, uh, emergency bonds, forest bonds, and many others. Um, so um, in, in that regard, actually, uh, PacLife uh, just issued um, a few weeks ago um, an 800 million five-year sustainability bond. Um, and mm -hmm. um, with it, I mean, uh, PacLife basically is committing to allocate the proceeds to existing or future investments in or financings of eligible uh, green and social projects like green buildings, uh, renewable and energy mm -hmm. efficiency, uh, sustainable water um, or wastewater management, um, biodiversity conservation projects, clean transportation, or access to essential services, and that's more the social part, like uh, education or uh, affordable housing. 
So this is the first class of products, um, very pure in the sense that you know what the proceeds are used for. And then a second mm -hmm. generation of products uh, em emerged in uh, 2016, first in supply chain financings, and then in loans in 2017, and then in bonds and derivatives in 2019. And that's what we call the sustainability linked product. Uh, and it goes, as you, uh, as you could see, across assets class. So here, the idea is not to look at what the proceeds are being used. We don't track the proceeds to see whether they're used to build a wind farm or to uh, distribute vaccines mm -hmm. uh, in emerging countries, let's say. Instead, so the, the, the proceeds can be used for general purpose uh, funding at the corporation level. Instead, we're going to link the interest rate that the borrower is paying on the bond or a loan to sustainability performance in the future years. So you select some key performance indicators, whether it's a reduction in CO2 emission intensity or in water intensity, or it's in percentage of women uh, sitting at the board level or in executive management, whatever you want, uh, as long as it's material to your business, uh, as long it's uh, also that the levels uh, of performance that are being chosen uh, are ambitious, that we try to stretch uh, the, the publicly committed targets that the corporate may have done around sustainability and give a financial incentive to go one extra mile. So um, this is the second class uh, of products that, is be that has been very uh, successful, uh, especially because, as you can see, it can apply to virtually to all sectors or almost all sectors, uh, since uh, mm -hmm. you don't need to identify purely sustainable projects, but in instead to identify sustainab measured sustainability performance. And in many instances, those products are substituting to traditional products, uh, bringing them with an ESG version of them. Excellent. Oh, great insight. And, and, you know, speaking of products, maybe we can switch gears here a, a little bit. And I'd love to hear your take or maybe some background on um, you know the recent IDB's Innovative uh, Index Americas initiative, which was uh, structured by BNB Paribas, maybe you can just discuss that a little yes, bit. Yes, sure. So this is uh, uh, just an example of uh, how far innovation can go, and how we can uh, uh, combine uh, ESG structuring with traditional products to to create impact. Mm -hmm. So um, in this instance. Um, Initially, it's a note that was uh, uh, issued uh, by one of our uh, financial institution clients, which is uh, Scotiabank. Um, it was mm -hmm. is issued in, uh, by Scotiabank Mexico, denominated in Mexican pesos. Um, and the coupon of the note, instead of being a traditional interest rate, uh, the coupon is linked to the return of an equity index. And that equity index was developed by the IDB and structured and commercialized by BNP Paribas. And this index is extremely interesting. It's called IDB Index Americas. It invests in uh, the 50 US companies that have a large uh, footprint in Latin America and the Caribbean that not only display high ESG performance, but also uh, demonstrate a significant contribution to socioeconomic development in the region. So, mm -hmm. you know, it goes one step beyond selecting companies that have a good environmental and social and governance performance. But on top of it, what the IDB did, uh, and with, with our help, was to develop an index where uh, aside from the 150 plus ESG indicators, there are an additional 17 development indicators, one for each of the UN Sustainability, Sustainability Development Goals, the SDGs, and mm -hmm. trying to evaluate mm -hmm. how each of those 50 companies are helping eliminate poverty by generating employment, by fostering inclusion, by empowering and serving, serving vulnerable communities, uh, while at the same time respecting social and natural capital. So it's a very interesting uh, investment product that's being um, offered to investors. You know, they have the ability to invest in a local currency note uh, with a um, interesting uh, uh, credit profile and have the return of uh, an equity basket that has been carefully selected for having impact and especially socioeconomic development impact uh, in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. 
Well, great. Hervé, thank you for unpacking the uh, IDB story there. It was very interesting to learn about that. And uh, congratulations on uh, the great success there. Uh, and in addition to that, you know, I want to thank you for taking this opportunity to uh, you know, spend time with us, taking time out of your busy day. I know our listeners are very grateful, I'm sure, for this uh, insight into sustainability, into ESG. And I, I really want to thank you uh, personally for, for coming on today and, and, and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, Jim. It was really my pleasure. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. And I want to encourage our listeners also, you know, you can learn more about the work Hervé and his colleagues are doing in sustainability by visiting BNP Paribas' CIB website by going to cib.bnpparibas.com. Again, Hervé, I want to thank you for your time today. And to our listeners, thanks for spending some time with us today. And I want to encourage you to listen to our next episode of the Wave Strength Podcast. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you and congratulations to Pacific Life for their inaugural sustainability bond. This has been another episode of The Wave Strength, presented by Pacific Life. Don't forget to catch us on YouTube and make sure to subscribe. Although this podcast is presented by Pacific Life, the opinions and views expressed are those of the hosts and participants and do not necessarily reflect Pacific Life's views on any of the topics discussed. Pacific Life is a product provider. It is not a fiduciary and therefore does not give advice or make recommendations regarding insurance or investment products. Pacific Life, its affiliates, its distributors, and respective representatives do not provide any employer-sponsored qualified plan administrative services or impartial advice about investments and do not act in a fiduciary capacity for any plan. Pacific Life refers to Pacific Life Insurance Company, Newport Beach, California, and its affiliates, including Pacific Life and Annuity Company. Insurance products are issued by Pacific Life Insurance Company in all states except New York and in all states by Pacific Life and Annuity Company. Product availability and features may vary by state. Each insurance company is solely responsible for the financial obligations accruing under the products it issues. This podcast was recorded on May 17, 2021.